Quite some time ago, I was compiling a list of the greatest finger strength scores we'd ever measured in female athletes, and Alison was right at the top of it. And naturally, I kind of wanted to dig into this information a little bit further as the numbers were fairly outrageous. Can you give me a bit of background on how you manage and operate your training and, and how you've done this over the years because as far as I understand you've had a few different inputs in terms of other people, coaches, uh, self-coaching, directing yourself in your progression. How's that balance kind of worked and what have you got out of that? I mean I, I grew up competing as a youth climber so I had a coach from when I was nine to I think 16 or 17 and then after that I was mostly just climbing for fun. I think I thought I was training because <laughs> I was going into the gym all the time, but I was really just climbing a lot in the gym. And I think I got a lot weaker from that, from 16 to, I don't know, 22. Um, I moved to Vancouver, BC in Canada to go to school. And I started working with Christian Kaur, who is legendary. Um, climber. He was the first ascent of Gioia in Italy, V16, one of the first in the world. Um, and my other coach, Jeff Thompson, who his background is actually in uh, gymnastics. He's been working in high performance gymnastics for like 45 years or something. So it was an interesting duo for competition climbing because when you think back to Christian's training and his era of doing really well in comps, it was like the smallest holds on the steepest wall. And if you can hold them like you win the comp and now competition climbing is so much more involved than that. And it's a way more full body experience and different movement styles and things like that. So that's where my coach Jeff with his background in gymnastics came in really handy. And I think they made a really good team with in terms of Jeff providing the full body conditioning and movement awareness and, and all that kind of stuff. And then, and Christian really digging deep into the things like fingerboarding or campusing or the drills and the more really climbing based foundational training exercises. Um, so I worked with them for, I think four or five years when I lived in Vancouver. Um, and then in July, 2020, I moved to Salt Lake to train with Kyra Condi for the Olympics. I wasn't going to the Olympics, but I was training with her when uh, she was getting ready for it. And, and that, that became a lot more self-directed training. So I wasn't really working with a coach anymore and I still am not. So that was almost two years ago now. Um, and I haven't really had a coach or been working on a training plan. And, and do you do yeah, that quite, do you do that quite intuitively now in the sense that you have had all those years of support and gaining knowledge and methodology from these individuals and working with, you know, as, as a junior as well. And now you kind of feel your way through training or are you still a paper journal spreadsheet kind of athlete what's that look like I'm definitely in the middle I write down all of my train I have like a training journal that I write down what I do every day um but a lot of it is by feel I have a general sense of like what I should be doing um I feel like my foundation of strength base is is pretty good at this point so I don't do as much general strength and conditioning as I did when I had a coach. Um, but in terms of, for example, I'm pretty poor at lock-offs. So that kind of training, that's off the wall lock-off training, I try to do at least once or twice a week. Um, I've been having knee issues, so I have a leg workout that I do at least once a week. Um, but that's all, it's all more colloquial and like really I guess niche is what you would say, like the, the physical strength training that I do, like overall body is really mm. niche to whatever I feel like my weakness is at that point. Yeah, I, I would say that that's not entirely uncommon at all amongst uh, elite level climbers that I've either worked with and sort of seen how they've looked after their own training or just ended up chatting to them informally at a crag or on a podcast. But what I definitely... It's, it's hard. It's, it's hard. It's hard when you like you don't exactly know what you're peaking for. Like sometimes mm. you do, sometimes you have a big trip coming up, but um, I definitely don't plan to like find a project necessarily. Like it's hard when you're, even if you're planning a trip and you're going some, somewhere you've never gone before, you never know like if you're gonna find a boulder that suits you or if it's gonna be a bad, you know, you're gonna be climbing things that are much lower than your maximum grade level or, cause I mean, theoretically you just wanna be 
speaking all the time. There's, you know, especially living in Utah, there's boulders all over the place that I want to do. So um, that factor is hard for sure. Yeah, I mean, oh, the whole topic of, oh, I just want to be peaking all the time. All I'd, the time. Uh, <laughs> every every, out, every outdoor climber in the world just saying, that's what I want to do all the time. Yeah, yeah. but unfortunately it doesn't work that way. <laughs> no, it, it doesn't. And y y I don't know if you agree with me. That, I mean, this is what uh, my kind of experience of my own career, sort of, sort of talking aside from sort of uh, training with clients is that, you can take that approach of trying to be in really good shape all the time. But I found that what happened was the, the longer I tried to do that in any particular cycles, the more the kind of in air, air quotes, the weak parts of my profile, whether it was I just have relatively poor upper back strength or uh, I don't have much power, they would just drop and drop and drop because I was never sort of intentionally working them at the same time as trying to be in a peak because I was always trying to rest just the right amount and trying to be in really good shape to try the hard things and everything was about quality but those things would slowly drift downwards in the background and I'd suddenly you know check in on them nine months later and go oh my word that's just awful I need to really get back on this and it, then it would cause tweaks and niggles and crap inconsistent performance. Yeah and I mean the other factor for me is that climbing is so mental and that try hard is such a vital part of the sport. And that is also what really drops off for me when I find myself pushing too hard for too long. Just the, that psych and the drive really takes a decline and, and sort of you get those classic burnout um, symptoms too. I, my hardest boulder to date I did this year in January. I worked on it for a month. So actually when I sent it, I said that it took 10 days and people were like, that's not that long. Um, or 10 sessions, I should say, but it was like 10 sessions within like three and a half weeks. Like I just like would go up there one day and then rest and then go back up and then rest and then go back. So it was three weeks of only trying that boulder. Um, this is the V14 show your scars. Yeah, show your scars in Ogden here in Utah. Um, and then Alex and I, Alex Johnson and I went to Waco, Waco tanks in Texas immediately after like i did that and i think i had a week and then we went to waco and i just i could barely do anything in waco i just like couldn't make myself try hard i was so tired and just like burnt out of being in the mental space of trying a hard boulder and everything like all the holds felt more painful than i think they normally like it was hard for me to overcome that that sensation of a hold being sharp um so anyway i think that was a good learning experience that stacking projects or trips or whatever that close together was like it's just not i don't think that's ever going to work for me i don't think i can go all in on one thing and then quick change up turn it around and do it again a week later 